Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and help us out on Patreon if you can. We appreciate you. An impulse in the field of rocket science is quantified by a force acting over a period of time. Therefore, impulse is measured in newton seconds, and the total force a rocket produces multiplied by the time over which the force was applied, gives us the total impulse. Divide this total impulse by the weight of the total propellant used, the weight, not the mass, and you will find another way to derive the specific impulse of a rocket engine. There are often many pathways that lead to the same solution. I recently saw a YouTube video titled, Believe Me, We Will Never Travel Among the Stars. I watched it, and they made a very strong argument that speed of light limitations will forever limit us to this star only. But I don't necessarily accept this argument as final, and neither did Albert Einstein. Einstein is revered because so many of his theories have stood the test of time. Albert Einstein was born in 1879 and lived during what many consider to be the golden age of science fiction. Science fiction has been a fairly good predictor of future technology. We all know that young people watching Star Trek in the 1960s went on to develop the cellular phone and ion propulsion. But long before that, back in the late 1800s, as Einstein was creating some of his most incredible ideas, another man was creating a new genre of fiction. H.G. Wells was a brilliant English author, teacher, and historian, born in 1866. When he was eight years old, he broke his leg and spent his convalescence reading books. He started his formal studies, but partway through, his father suffered an injury that left him unable to fully support the family. Wells was apprenticed to a drapery emporium in 1880. There, at the age of 14, he was worked 13 hours a day. This gave him an acute understanding of how disparities in wealth can inhibit a child's ability to reach their potential. He went on to author novels that discussed this dynamic, including The Wheels of Chance, The History of Mr. Polly, and Kipps. Wells' father was what was politely called at that time a free thinker. This usually meant agnostic or atheist. His mother was more religious, and this caused some lively debates in his home. Wells failed as both a draper and later as a chemist apprentice, absolutely hating the work in both cases. His mother was working as a maid at a country house in Sussex, and this gave Wells access to the library there. He read everything from Plato's Republic and Thomas More's Utopia to Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe. In 1879, Wells became what was called a pupil teacher, somewhat of a teaching assistant, and later took a position at Midhurst Grammar School. This allowed him to work on his self-education later earning a scholarship to the Normal School of Science and studying biology under Thomas Huxley. He helped set up the Royal College of Science and became the first president in 1909. He was happy there, but it still was not easy. He spent much of his stipend on books and later wrote of constant hunger. He then founded the Science School Journal, where he encouraged the expression of what we would now call science fiction writing a short story called The Chronic Argonauts that laid the foundation for what would become one of his most famous novels, The Time Machine. He went on to introduce many fantastic concepts to the world audience. Genetic engineering with the island of Dr. Moreau, the concept of invisibility with the invisible man, space travel with the first men on the moon, and finally, the world set free in 1914. In this book, Wells tried to imagine what was to come, from his understanding of science to that point. Amazingly, this novel describes how radioactive elements like radium and uranium could lead to an atomic bomb and atomic energy. This book made a great impression on the physicist Leo Zillard, who went on to patent the concept of a nuclear reactor in 1934. I bring you to this point to argue that speculative fiction can help us learn to think outside the box. And this brings us back to modern science fiction and propellantless propulsion systems. There have been hundreds of designs of such machines, 
that would be able to exert some type of force that would move a spaceship without a propellant exhaust. Let's look back at some of these ideas. The EM drive concept was developed in 2001. This concept used a resonant cavity and a microwave emitter to reflect microwaves against the interior of the device. Since microwave photons have mass only because they have energy, but are massless at rest, it was believed by the designers that the photons could impart pure momentum to the thruster. Initial tests in 2016 by NASA and another in 2021 at the Dresden University of Technology did detect a small apparent thrust, but these measurements unfortunately disappeared when tested using point suspension. The Q drive, or Kinet drive, is a similar idea. This device uses a flat cavity rather than a conic one and was planned to be used in a CubeSat in space, but funding could not be secured. Researchers in China built a resonant cavity thruster in 2008, and a 2012 report claimed that thrust had been produced. But in 2014, the same researchers found that their result was due to experimental error. In 2016, several resonant cavity thrusters were stacked and a semi-cylinder design was used. This may have been tested in orbit, but we don't have reliable data on it. It is argued by many scientists that these devices not only have not worked, but cannot work. They argue that it would violate the law of conservation of momentum, allowing an interaction that would create a net force, violating the rule that for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. Further studies seem to have proven the failure of these devices to produce a true net thrust. Are there other concepts that might be valid? First, let's look at analogs to motion that do not expend an onboard propellant. We can drive a car without using mass exhaust thrust because the car's tires push against the earth itself. The car expends energy, of course, but there is no mass being expelled. Would it be possible to use a similar method of propulsion to lift our ship serenely from the surface of the earth with power alone? If so, what could we push against? Let's start with the earth's electromagnetic field. We all live on a massive magnet. The spinning of the Earth's core creates an electric current that generates a powerful magnetic field. The north pole of this magnet is here and the south pole is here. This field protects the Earth from the solar winds and ion storms, generated by the sun's nuclear fusion and coronal mass ejections. Without this shield, life on Earth would be much more difficult. Could we create a magnetic field in our ship large enough and strong enough to lift us into the air and on up into orbit? by using the Earth's magnetic field? It turns out that we could, but the power required is beyond anything we have available right now. Perhaps fusion energy will eventually give us enough power, and while this process would get us into orbit, as we moved away from the Earth and off into space, the force of the Earth's field would weaken. Could we then use the magnetic field generated by the Sun? The Sun's magnetic field is strong enough to cause trillions of tons of plasma, to be ejected from its surface at an average velocity of 489 kilometers per second. Bear in mind that to get into orbit, a starship needs to generate 9.4 kilometers per second. These events are called coronal mass ejections and have been measured to reach velocities of up to 3,200 kilometers per second, which is 3,200,000 meters per second, with an average mass of 1,600,000,000 metric tons. The force needed to do this is 5.12 quintillion newtons, all from the force of magnetic field lines. These field lines contain enormous amounts of energy, and a friend of mine has postulated that we could use superconducting magnets and metamaterials to ride these field lines at a constant acceleration of 1g to the edge of the solar system, reversing the polarity to return. This may be a viable means of transolar travel in the future, a type of rail line to the outer worlds and back. The equations are beyond my area of expertise, but he's a very smart man, and I hope he's right. On the other hand, could we build a large ship, shield it from radiation, and park it near the sun, using our onboard fusion or antimatter engines to stimulate a large coronal mass ejection under our ship? riding the resultant wave of matter and energy out to the stars. There would be a lot of technical problems to overcome, not the least of which would be tremendous g-forces. 
but there is no reason to believe it is impossible. There are other methods to consider. We know that virtual particles pop in and out of our universe in something called quantum foam. Would it be possible to generate a fast pulsing electromagnetic field that could eject these virtual particles from our quantum engine, moving us through the quantum foam like a boat's propeller on a lake? It may be that these particles don't exist long enough to interact with the electromagnetic field our engine generates, but I don't think we can safely say it's impossible yet. And what about other forces? There are four known forces in our universe. The electromagnetic force we just discussed. The weak and strong nuclear forces are very short range. But what about gravity? We know the particles that transmit the other three forces. But what carries the gravitational force? We know that this force distorts the space-time continuum. But are there particles called gravitons that we could block? so as to need only a gentle push to get us up into orbit? Or could we create a graviton generator, attaching it to our ship and pointing it at the moon or sun, a kind of gravity laser, pulling ourselves off the Earth on a rope of pure gravitational energy? We don't know yet, at least not for sure. The closest thing to a propellantless drive that I can find today is a concept being developed by Dr. James F. Woodward. Dr. Woodward is a professor emeritus of history and an adjunct professor of physics who completed his Ph.D. in 1972 at the University of Denver. In 1990, he developed a physics hypothesis related to the Mach effect. The Mach effect is related to Mach's principle, which postulated that inertia, the resistance of mass to acceleration, is the result of the gravitational field generated by all of the mass in the universe. And when I say mass, I am including the mass equivalent of energy. The force of gravity is, in effect, infinite. Which means that we are all caught in a web of energy that stretches from one side of our rapidly expanding universe to the other. According to Mach's principle, elucidated and named by Albert Einstein, when we start trying to move, we must first overcome the resistance of this gravitational energy web, created by all the matter and energy in the universe. Dr. Woodward believes that we could essentially push off against this web by charging and discharging zirconium crystals with a particular frequency, causing them to gain mass when charged. This greater mass is then shifted so as to move the ship forward, then the mass is reduced as the crystals discharge and move back to their original positions. NASA has given Dr. Woodward two grants so far to continue his research and a variation of his device seemed to be able to generate a thrust of 100 micronewtons. The Naval Research Laboratory in Maryland is scheduled to test the thruster further when it resumes full operation after the COVID shutdown. This right now is the most promising hope for this type of propulsion. And in the same laboratory, Professor Harold G. White is working on perfecting the Alcubierre warp drive, discussed in this lesson where the warping of space and time allows us to travel to distant destinations by folding the space between them. The idea has enough merit that it has received NASA funding, though nothing is yet certain. Let's look at one more possibility. Can we somehow block the effects of the recently discovered Higgs boson, which binds us to the Higgs field, that works through the weak nuclear force to give everything with mass or energy inertia? And if we could weaken or break free from this field, would we instantly attain the speed of light? Or at least be able to accelerate to ultra-high velocities with a lot less force? No one knows. These technologies are in the gray area between science and science fiction. But if history is any guide, someday our descendants will use technology we cannot yet imagine to travel between the stars looking with fondness on the naysayers of our time. Thanks for listening, and stay safe at Astro Proterra.